Okay, today my topic is protocol obsessed programming. And um, I started like with Objective-C in I think in 2003, and I am not sure whether we already had protocols in that version. And what I noticed is in Objective-C we have like relatively few protocols. For instance, I looked at the foundation framework, and I did the count, and we have 356 classes and only 26 protocols. Well, I didn't count by hand, but of course I used some like some grab and stuff because I'm lazy. And then I uh, looked at Swift, and uh, in Swift we are using way more protocols. For instance, uh, the int um, the int type alone has like more than 13 protocols. I stopped counting at 13 because again I'm lazy. And uh, so, how is it that in Swift one type has like half as many protocols as our whole foundation framework in Objective-C. So maybe we should ask the question whether we should use more protocols. And if they are so cool in Swift, why not use even more? So um, to find that out, let's do an experiment. And as always, start with the graph, yeah? So you have, uh, on the x-axis we have the time, and on the y-axis we have the protocol density. And of course, design, there is no like hard like limits where you can say this is absolutely right, this is absolutely wrong. So let's just say there is kind of like a, an area, an area where the protocol density is about right. So it's correct. And let's assume we are somewhere here because we have to start somewhere. And now we want to try uh, to find out like how few are too few and how many are too many. And for that, we have a look at two examples. The first one, we built an example in Swift. I actually converted all the code to th Swift 3 yesterday. Um, in Swift, um, without protocols. So we built a small piece of software and not use any protocols at all. To find out how many protocols are definitely not too many because we don't use any. That even rhymes. OK, so then we go the next step and uh, go to the other extreme and start over to protocol obsession and put protocols in everything. Where we can find something, we put a protocol in it, and we try to um, not use concrete types uh, whenever possible. And uh, hopefully, in the end, this gives us a bit of um, orientation, whether we are now uh, a bit below where we should use protocols, or right, or maybe over, even overusing them now. OK, so the structure of the uh, is I will show this example. First without protocols, uh, then with protocol obsession, and then we will have a look at the effects of this protocol obsession, how it changed our code, how it um, influenced uh, stuff good or bad, and in the end I will try to come up with some recommendations when to use protocols and when not to use protocols. So the example. Of course it's always hard to come up with an example that is uh, on one hand not too small and on the other hand not too big. Uh, I chose um, something, a library for collection views, something like a collection tools, you can say. So uh, the first thing that we have is we will have a model that is, um, that is containing the collection view content. So it will not have something like concrete cell classes or views or stuff like that, but it will have something like uh, a notion of uh, items, sections, and like cell identifiers, which are strings and models. Then we have an adapter which adapts this model to a data source protocol. There we can't, of course, we have to use a protocol because we can't otherwise get around it. Then we will, um, the third class will be um, a class that models the updates between two models. And of course, we can um, then apply these updates to a collection view by performing them on the collection view. So the fourth class is actually UI collection view. It's a bit outside, and uh, the, the task to perform updates on this collection view will actually be taken over by the collection updates. OK, so the example without protocols. Let's get started. First, the collection model. The collection model, um, basically its task is to model the collection view content. So let's start. Of course, we are, we are trying not to use classes because it's not cool anymore. So we use a struct. And that struct has like uh, a couple of public functions. For the sake of simplicity, I chose not to uh, have something like number of sections because then it gets too crowded on the slides. But we have a number of items in a section. We have a cell identifier at a certain um, in uh, sec uh, cell identifier at a certain index path. We have a cell model at a certain index path, and of course we need 
some way of constructing these structs. So we have a, one method that uh, one method that allows us to to add a cell identifier and a model basically appended to this collection model. So very simple, normal struct. Um, I took out the implementations because it's uh, about the more well, about the interfaces in this talk. The second part is uh, we need something. Now we have this collection model, and now we need this collection model to somehow like speak the language of a collection view data source. And for that, we use a, I call it a data source adapter. This one is basically adapting this model inside the collection view um, collection view protocol. Uh, sorry, collection view data source protocol. And now we need a way to configure the cells because the model only has something like um, model elements and um, cell identifiers. And now we need to somehow configure a cell with the content um, that this model is. And for that, we overwrite a method. And here's the data source adapter. So uh, the first thing is we have uh, one. Um, we have one property that gives us the, uh, the po possibility to set in the collection uh, to, to set the collection model. Another one that's basically the data source we can use on our um, on our collection view. And then we have this plug-in method we can override, which uh, is named configure cell at index pass with model. So whenever now um, we use this, um, this method will be called for each for each entry inside this model to um, put data inside the model. Now we'll have a look at the usage. How do we use that? First, um, here's a simple example. We say we just have one cell type that has a use identifier cell. And uh, now we make our subclass of this uh, collection data source adapter. And inside the configure method, we just uh, basically know we only get one cell type and one model type. And we just do a guard statement. and um, if everything is fine, we just set the model on the cell. And of course, this could be like more complex for real examples, but this is like for now. And the second part is, now that we have that, we can um, use it. And here we put it into a collection view controller to, um, to make this collection view show at our data. So what we do is we start with a collection model, put some data in here. I just started with like one cell that contains an A. And um, I add this to the model. And then I can basically tell the adapter, you should now adapt this collection model. And then I have can um, set the collection views data source to the adapter's data source. And now it will show up. So the collection updates. Um, the collection updates is a class that uh, as the name says, it represents the updates between co two collection view models. And um, now we needed to create it at some point. Where do we put the, like the constructor, <laughs> the initializer? And uh, instead of having like an uh, initializer on uh, that takes two models, I decided to put it with a, an extension on the um, collection model. So you um, can ask a collection model, give me your updates to this model. And um, then we need to update the collection view when you have these updates, and we perform these updates on the collection view by using an instance method. So here's the code. The struct will have some kind of like uh, fields for uh, index path for inserted, deleted, removed, uh, reloaded, moved items, and it will have a perform method, which allows us to perform it on a collection view. And then we have the um, extension of the collection model, which allows us to construct these objects. So we now have the possibility to do something like this. Let's say we have um, a target model that we would like to um, show. And now we say, tell our collection view, well, I would like to perform batch updates. And the starting model is the model that the adapter currently holds. And the updates are the updates from this um, current model to this two model. And then um, we tell our adapter, you now have the new collection, uh, new, the new model. And then we tell this updates object that we just built, perform, please perform on this collection view. And then we get, uh, hopefully, we get like shiny animations and everything working fine. OK, so this was the class example without any protocols. Does anyone feel like this is like enough protocols? None? 
Okay. <laughs> one. Okay. At least one, but uh, I don't think so. <laughs> so uh, now we need to uh, do the same thing with protocol obsession. And protocol obsession is for me that I try not to expose any concrete types like classes, structs, or enums. I only want to expose protocols. So basically, whenever I have something that's public and is a struct, it's wrong. Whenever there's a class, it's wrong. Whenever it's an enum, it's wrong. Just try only to expose protocols. And then, of course, we have the problem if we only get, uh, have a public interface that co is composed of protocols, where do we put object construction? And for now, I just said, OK, I simply use like functions on uh, my module, which uh, will work fine for object creation. So I will have only protocols and functions in the end. Um, yeah, first, the collection model again. What we need to add is some kind of way to construct them. So I added a builder protocol and a function for the creation. So this is how it looked before. Oh, sorry, no, uh, this is how it looks now. Um, we have the public protocol now instead of a public struct, which has exactly the same models. Um, the method to add some stuff to this model is now on a builder protocol. And then we have a function which gets in um, a block that gets this builder and can build this um, object. It will be more clear in a, uh, when we look at the usage uh, on the next, no, it's not on the next slide, but the one after. So the data source adapter um, still has the same role as before, but now we need, again, to change some stuff. Um, we can't configure cells by overriding a method anymore because we have no class or uh, class where you can override a method. So uh, we just uh, pull out this method to a protocol because we like protocols and make it a settable property and uh, we add a function to do the object creation. This is how the code looks now. We have the configure method now on the protocol. This is exactly the same method we had before for override. The protocol um, for the collection data source adapter gets one uh, additional, um, gets one additional property, which is the cell configurator, which we can set. And then we have the construction function, which basically uh, is our replacement for the init. So this is how the usage looked before for this, um, for this configuration of the cells. We had to do a subclass of a concrete class out of our framework. And now it looks like this. So there is a tiny difference, but not that much, because now we can just uh, make the um, implementation of that method on any type we want. We can do it, just do it on a struct instead of like doing it on a concrete subclass. Of course, that means we also lose this override, um, this override keyword because we're not overriding anything anymore. Other than that, it's exactly the same code. So not much change. Um, for the initial initialization inside the viewed load, uh, this is how it looked before, and this is how it looked after. Again, not much change. Of course, because we have not this concrete subclass anymore, but uh, we switch to, in the f uh, second line, we switch to the um, construction by using this uh, function. And uh, we switch to the, over to the new kind of um, how we initialize the model here. And we have to set the cell configurator on the adapter. But again, not, not that much change. So the last thing we have is um, we have this creation uh, via the, um, uh, sorry, we have the collection updates. The collection updates, we now, we had before, we had um, the class extension, which was used to um, create these objects. Of course, now it becomes a protocol extension because we have no classes anymore that we expose. And uh, when we do updates on a collection view, it's bad because collection view is a concrete class. So we instead add a protocol there as well so that we can basically apply this to anything that has a certain target protocol. Here's the code for that. Um, we now have a public protocol collection updates. And we need some changes because in protocols you can't say let. You can have instead to say it's a, a vari variable property which has a, only a get, um, which only has a getter, not a setter. Then this, uh, the perform on function now oh, it's one too far the perform on function now uh, lives in its uh, on uh, on an extension of collection updates 
and the last part basically stays unchanged because there's nothing to change here because um, before collection model was a class, now it's a protocol, and uh, before it was a struct, now it's a protocol, so it's no difference there. Now, uh, what is this collection updates target that we have, uh, we have in this extension for the collection updates? Because before we had a perform on method that was performing on a collection view, now it's only performing on some target protocol that we added. And this is basically the idea, we don't want to restrict that to only collection views, so just put in the protocol, put in the methods inside the protocol that we want to call, and uh, then tell that the collection view um, implements this protocol, or conforms to this protocol. And so now we can call it on anything that has also the other protocol. Okay, how does the usage change? This is how it looked before, and this is how it looked after. It may be a bit surprising, but there's no changes, because I mean, we don't do object creation, and uh, the other stuff was uh, classes before, but not protocols, but all the methods are exactly named the same. They get the same uh, arguments, so no changes in usage. So what are the effects of what we are currently doing here? I mean, what, what has changed? From the usage perspective, not that much. I mean, okay, we have a different way of constructing stuff. At some points, we have like, um, Instead of like subclassing, we have a protocol that we set, but other than that, like there were not many changes on the user's perspective. However, on the other perspectives, a lot of stuff has changed. First, we have really good decoupling, which means we can easier reuse parts of this code and we can easier test it. And I mean, if we can get easier reuse and easier test without much effort, why not do it? The next one is we have information hiding. We don't expose how we implement something. That me means we can change it afterwards. I mean, it's like this Las, Las Vegas thing, yeah? What's, what happens behind the protocol stays behind the protocols, right? I mean, it's, it, it's, our, it's our turn, we can, we can change it. And uh, the other thing is like, I always think about concrete type. I mean, what is concrete, right? Concrete is something that you're building houses on. And in the beginning, it's very malleable and very soft, but then it stays, gets harder and harder to change, right? And so if we have a concrete type that we have somewhere that we expose, then we'll never, it, the chances are we can never get rid of it. Whereas if we have a protocol in between, we can change it behind the scenes, we are free. And uh, one thing that I would like to mention, it's not on the slides, but um, we don't have generic types on protocols, but we only have associated types. Um, I still haven't un exactly understood the difference, but <laughs> there's like a small but uh, small difference between those, but you can use them roughly for the same things. And um, the last one is we have this challenge of object creation because I'm not happy with these functions because it just it just feels wrong. I mean, this is something that where the protocol obsession maybe took us too far in this example. Uh, for the decoupling, I would like to uh, again show like what, what I mean here, to start that point a bit. Um, so we had this version without the protocols. In the version without the protocols, we can use the collection model in isolation. We can just take this collection model and reuse it without reusing any parts of the others, uh, of any other parts of the library. We can just uh, take that. Oh, that was the clicker starts acting up. So um, the collection model, we can use that in isolation. However, if we now want to use the data source adapter, it requires us to use our concrete implementation of collection model to be usable. So we can't use and we can't test the data source adapter in isolation, but we can only test it, oh, come on, now. <laughs> we can only test it together with the data source adapter. Uh, to, uh, we can only test the data source adapter together with the collection model. The same goes for the collection updates. The collection updates currently in the version without protocols require that we have two collection models, and these are concrete types. So whenever I want to use these collection updates, um, I have to have instances of this collection model. And even worse, if I want to use this perform method of the collection updates, it requires a concrete UI collection view, which I can only apply to collection views currently, 
And uh, because I can't make a collection updates without having the collection model, I can actually only use these three together, both in tests and when I want to reuse. If I look at the protocol obsessed version, we can use the collection model in isolation. But then if I want to uh, have this data source adapter, I can give it every implementation of this collection model protocol. So I can use it in isolation. I can just uh, implement my own collection model if I would like to. The same applies to tests. I can simulate a collection model for tests and then uh, um, test my data source adapter in isolation. For the collection updates, the same. To construct a collection update, I don't need a concrete collection model, but I only need something that conforms to the right protocol. And so I can use and test the collection updates in isolation. And the same goes for the perform method. The perform method now only requires that I conform to a certain target protocol. And if I implement that target protocol, for instance, on a table view, I could apply the same thing to a table view as well. Now we have one problem um, that was introduced because we have so much information hiding. Um, we get one disadvantage because uh, before we had this like graph, I mean, we had a collection view controller, the collection view controller is holding onto the data source adapter, and the data source adapter is holding onto the collection model. Now, if we go into this protocol obsessed version, someone could say, ah, oh, great, I want to implement my collection model in the collection view controller. I would not do that, but it's possible now, and so we have to think about what happens then. Because if, if now, the collection view controller is actually the collection model because it conforms to it, we have a strong reference cycle because the collection view controller holds onto the data source adapter and the data source adapter holds the collection model, which is the collection view controller. Um, we can work around that. I, we can, the first thing is we can ignore it, just recognize that there is this problem and ignore it because this is what happens if you decouple so much. The other solution is we can say, okay, we require the collection model to only be implemented by classes, then we can make the um, link to the collection model weak. But now we uh, introduce another problem because now the, if we don't implement our collection model in the collection view controller, it will just die because there's only one weak reference to it. So if we have that, the user of our framework would have to introduce an additional strong reference to the collection model. So this is one thing we have to be aware of. It's uh, something, but it's something that uh, may come up even like with objects. But uh, if we have like concrete structs, this can't happen because nobody can replace anything. And so we can force them to use like the right, the right objects. Okay, so what are my recommendations? I mean, I think, I think, all of you can agree that maybe the first version had too little protocols and maybe the second one was a bit too crazy. So uh, what do I think about concrete types? I think we should only expose concrete types to the outside if first we are 100% sure that we exactly want this one thing and nothing else. Like for instance, I mean, we won't introduce a protocol to decouple from strings or numbers. It doesn't make sense because it's okay to reuse this one string. It will never be something different. If I have something like an NS index path, I don't want to say, okay, this index path, I want to be able to replace it in tests. It's just a value object. It's not interesting enough to be a replacement for, uh, to have a replacement for that. And then that also means that in tests, I can't replace it, but that's fine. I mean, if I'm 100% sure that this is the only one instance I want, why not expose it? Um, the second thing is, if you need subclassing. Sometimes you have um, class hierarchies, and if you have a class hierarchy um, that you want to use for design reasons, of course you have to expose the superclass of everything. For instance, like try to come up with a UI view. I mean, it's like a whole class hierarchy. You can't just do that for protocols because you need subclassing for that. Of course, you can like try to shift around by use subprotocols, but that's kind of cheating then. Just uh, expose the class. Of course, this only applies if you have actually a class and not structs. And the last one is, and this is the way around these uh, horrible like functions, if you have a default implementation for something that you want people to use, for instance, uh, with a collection model, you have a, collection model, a default collection model, or maybe you would call it the simple collection model because it has nothing added, then you could expose this struct but still keep the protocol. And so it will feel natural to um, 
to construct <laughs> these objects or th these uh, instances, but you won't have this thing that it yeah that it feels like it's not right code because nobody uses like functions on the modules. And so the question in the beginning I uh, asked like should we use more protocols? And my answer to that is it's worth a try. Thank you very much. <laughs>